Hello, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I am an elder lawyer, elder law lawyer, and I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell in Worcester. Uh, some of you folks that have met me before, you know the firm has 67 people in it. Uh, I'm the one that does elder law. This presentation is a follow-up to the one that we did here in Oak Bluffs in July, when we, I brought out uh, a woman to talk extensively. She was a nurse uh, who works with um, a contractor who happens to be her husband, and they talked about all of the different ways that you could adapt your home so that you can keep living in it, so that you can live in it ideally until you die, because that's, what I always say, the goal of most of my clients when I do elder law is to live in your house until you die and be buried in the backyard. So the question is, how can you continue to be comfortable there living in your house, and how can you keep it safe? And, and we talked about a tremendous number uh, of options. Um, we, we, and, and by the way, the couple that I'm gonna talk about as the example is always my friends Frank and Mary. So Frank and Mary have a house, and I'm assuming that they have a house here uh, on Martha's Vineyard. So it might be worth more than this number, but it is, we're saying her, their house is worth about $400,000. Uh, he has an IRA worth, worth 100,000. They have a small bank account with 200,000. They're living on social security. So they're okay, they're paying their taxes, they're making ends meet, you know, they're gonna be in some trouble if they have a big financial problem, but otherwise they're okay. But their real issue is they really, they love this house. They've been here in Martha's Vineyard for a long time. They love the house, they wanna stay. And the question is, how can they manage if they wanna be adapting their house so that they can stay there uh, as they get older and just in case they get more frail? Um, you know, and there are, there are the question, you know, because they have a wonderful little home, uh, but they may want, they may need some kind of railing in order to be able to get in safely. They may need a number of smaller improvements that we talked about last month, things like improving the kinds of flooring that you have so that it's no slip, or adapting your doorknobs so that they press as opposed to having to turn the doorknobs. Um, there are more advanced adaptations that we talked about last month. We talked about really changing your bathroom, changing your kitchen, and there are the great tools that are available to do all of these things now, as well as doing things like making sure that all of your, the, the, the entries from room to room are wide enough so that a wheelchair can get through. But all of that costs money. So um, I asked two people to come here to talk to you about that. One, Steve Greenberg, uh, is going to talk about reverse mortgages because I guess the question: If you are Frank and Mary, and you have the, and you are in their financial situation, is you've really got three possibilities. One is I'm going to go back to their numbers. One is you can go to the bank and you can get a regular first mortgage. In this case, they don't have a first mortgage right now. Um, and the advantage of a first mortgage is that the interest rates tend to be so low. But the disadvantage is, if you've got a straight first mortgage, you've got a monthly payment. Now, Frank is earning uh, um, uh, $2,000 a month, and Mary is earning $750 a month. For them to add an extra mortgage payment onto their monthly bill may be too much for them. Uh, a second possibility, which you can once again get from the bank, and this may be the right solution for you, would be to get some kind of a line of credit, to go to the bank and get a line of credit loan. Traditionally, a it, when you're getting a line of credit loan, the advantages, and any of the local banks will offer this, the advantages are first, while getting a first mortgage requires that you demonstrate not only that you have a lot of value in your house, but also that your income is of a certain level. Typically on a line of credit loan, they don't look at income, they just look at the value of your house. Um, second, the closing costs 
on a line of credit loan to tend to be substantially lower than they are if you're doing a first mortgage. Often banks don't even require an attorney to do a line of credit loan as opposed to paying the attorney's fees. I mean, nothing wrong with paying attorney's fees, you know, but as, as opposed to, you know, having to pay the attorneys, you know, if you can go to the bank and get a loan officer to take care of the documents, that may be less expensive. Third, on a line of credit loan, as opposed to the first mortgage, you don't typically have to take all the money out, which means you don't have to be paying interest on it, because unless you've taken the money out, you're not paying interest on the money. So it may be that that's the most sensible device. I was just talking to somebody earlier this week, because I find myself, as you, I've mentioned before, I'm always looking for a tax deductible reason to come to Martha's Vineyard, so I'm always coming to see clients. So I found myself, and this woman was just saying, she had a $70,000 line of credit with one of the local banks that was just running out. She'd never used it. And the question was, so she, should she get it again? What were the pluses and minuses? And I told her, I said, to me, this is a big plus to doing that, right? As long as the cost of getting the, 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 uh, the line of credit mortgage again is not high, because then the reserve is there. If she needs the money later, and if for some reason her financial situation has changed, if for whatever reason she needs the money, she doesn't have to go through the exercise at some later point of going to the bank. Now she's got this $70,000 checkbook, basically. She's got a huge credit card that she can pull from in an emergency. Right? So it may be that you want to look at one of those two options. If, on the other hand, you don't, right? uh, if you don't want that, that, that line of credit, or if you feel that you need to be borrowing more money than that and the bank won't give you that, the, the amount that you think that you want to have for the line of credit, then you want to look at these two other possibilities. Um, so I want to first I want to introduce actually both folks. I've just met them today. Um, I was I was reaching out to folks because I really wanted to talk to somebody about who kind of specializes in both of these areas. Steve Greenberg is going to talk first. Uh, he does reverse mortgages and he's going to talk to you all about reverse mortgages. Now, as I've as I've said in previous presentations and looking about financial options, a reverse mortgage may be a terrible idea for you. You may not want to do it, and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about a little bit later on is kind of what are the pluses and minuses, but it may also be an ideal situation, especially if you are older and you meet, the, and you meet these criteria, um, um, and so Steve will go over that. The second is a special program uh, that is run through, is, are these all state funds or are they federal funds? State. They're state funds. Uh, a special program that is designed actually to do this, to help you um, take out a loan that will allow you to do these kinds of improvements up to a given dollar amount. Mm -hmm. And Mary Ann Walsh, oh, I'm terrible on names. As you all know, I'm getting older. That's why I like doing elder law, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like clients that still think that I'm young. You know, I, I'm not. Mary Ann has, has come actually from uh, Framingham because it turns out that the, the nonprofit, the South Middlesex Opportunity Council, who is the, the who covers uh, Martha's Vineyard, is like, you always have this happen, right? It's not in Martha's Vineyard. In this case, they're actually in Framingham. So she's gonna be talking to you about how that program works. So first, I'd like Steve to come and talk to you and talk to you about reverse mortgages. I'd like you to hold all questions regarding either speaker until the end. The only one that gets to ask questions during this is me because I'm the moderator, okay? Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Thank you folks for taking the time to join us here today. It's very much appreciated. Um, my sole focus since 2005 has been on reverse mortgages. I've worked with Bank of New York, with MetLife Bank, and currently I'm with iReverse Home Loans, which is a subsidiary of Hopkins Federal Savings Bank. And I work as an individual branch operator for them and been doing this solely since 2005. So why don't we jump right in and start right from the beginning and just say, what the heck is a HECM. A HECM is a Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. That is the government regulated, government insured reverse mortgage. It's been in the marketplace since about 1989. And when I say it's government regulated and government insured, it's regulated by HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and it's insured by FHA, Federal Housing Authority. What it allows you to do, it allows those that are 62 and over that are, residing in, that are residing in their home as their primary residence to access some of that equity to take care of whatever their need might be. 
And you know, one of the needs is just what we're talking about today if you need to modify your home. Any funds that you access from a reverse mortgage are tax-free funds. They're all tax-free dollars. And the simple reason for that is, is that you are loaning yourself this money. You are loaning yourself some of the equity of your property. The IRS says this is a loan. It's not income, so therefore it is not taxable. There are no monthly mortgage payments. There are no required payments on a monthly ba basis. If you choose to make payments, you certainly can. There are no prepayment penalties whether you pay this off a little bit at a time or if you pay back the full amount. There are no prepayment penalties at any time. You take out one of these mortgages, the next week you hit the Powerball, pay it off, no payments, you're all set. Um, insurance, I'm insurance, interest deduction on your taxes, your mortgage interest deduction. Obviously, if you're not making any payments, you're not paying any interest, so therefore you don't have that yearly interest deduction on your mortgage. At the conclusion of the HECA mortgage, at that particular time when it's paid back, either you, if you're the one that's paid it back by selling the property or something to that effect, and or your estate will get the benefit of the interest deduction at that particular time. You're making the payment, so therefore you're gonna get the advantage of that interest deduction. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your tax advisor on those rules because they do follow the rules of a home equity line of credit, which is a little bit different. So you wanna make sure that you uh, check with your tax advisor. No need to repay the loan, as we said. The, the only time that the loan is due is when you permanently move out of the house in other words, if you're transitioning into a nursing home, an assisted living facility, something like that, you know that's the last step. If you're out of your home for 12 consecutive months, it can be considered no longer your primary residence and therefore it can become due. Obviously when you sell the house. And the HECA mortgage works exactly like a conventional mortgage. If you had a conventional mortgage on your home and you sold it, you pay what is owed to the bank and you keep the rest. Exactly the same on a home equity conversion mortgage. You pay back what is owed to the bank and you keep whatever is remaining. The, um, let's go into a quick little historical perspective of these. The federal government got involved in these in 1989. The first one was done in the mid-60s up in Maine. And I always say from the mid-60s to 1989, it's like the Wild West days. There were no rules, no regulations, and quite frankly, it was quite ugly. In 1989, the federal government got involved, and they got involved for really a couple of different reasons. One being that to clean up the business, really. Seniors are a protected class in this country. Seniors, children, they're protected classes. So that's one reason why the federal government got in. The other reason why the federal government got into this program is simply because it saves them hundreds of millions of dollars. And it saves them hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of time simply because the longer you are able to reside in your home, the longer you are able to reside in your home safely, because that's what the key is, is to do it safely the less that the federal government is going to have to subsidize your living arrangements somewhere else. 